This is the Six Man Show, an Orlando Magic podcast, with your hosts, Luke Silvia and Jonathan Osborne, covering all things Magic basketball. By fans, for fans. Go Magic! What's going on, Orlando Magic fans? You guys are back with the Six Man Show. Today is October 16th, 2023. Jonathan Osborne here. As always, joined by my co-host, Luke Sylvia. Luke, nine days until the start of the NBA regular season, baby. Well, not the regular season, but the Magic season specifically. Correct. Yeah, that's the only season we really care about, if we're being honest. Correct. We got these preseason games that happened the last week. We got a couple happening this week. And in between this time, Jonathan, I went to the old Disney World. Over the weekend, where it felt pretty good outside. Sick invite, right? All right, yeah. You're hey, you want to go? <laughs> um, and we're both pass holders now. We have to make it happen officially. Yes, yes, we but do. I we will, will tell the listeners that not this time, but the last time Luke went to Disney, he did throw me an invitation, even though it was like 16 hours notice. But hey. nonetheless, it was an invitation. If you're a pass holder, you know, just just float invites here Stop and there. And eventually, over. we'll make yeah. it happen. And yeah. we did that with, with our kids. I think what we're going to start doing, though, is leaving our youngest, Cole, not Cole Anthony, with one of our parents because he just doesn't. You know, he doesn't know. The only thing you're doing at that point is throwing him off an app schedule, right? Parents understand this. Harper, she enjoys it. She's the reason we got the passes. So she enjoys it. Her cousins went the other day. My brother just got passes as well, um, which he thanked me for because that's the only reason they got him is because we told his wife and his wife was like, hey, let's let's do it. Now the nephews have play dates there at Disney. So a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Lauren and I are going to hit up our anniversary is this Friday. Our five-year anniversary is this Friday. So we're going to... Congrats. Thursday, sorry, Thursday. And on Friday, we're going to hit up Epcot, do a little... Uh, yep. Drink and eat around the world. Yep. Going to be pumped. No kids. We're going to be full Disney adulting at, at Epcot on Friday. And I don't really care. Carmen will be at Epcot on Friday. Or really? well, she'll be in the Disney area on Friday. I don't know if she's going to be at Epcot. Well, those are but big, yeah. big, big details. I won't be there, unfortunately. I was, I was not invited. It's like a, you know, girl's trip. So. Mm. But that's exciting stuff. You know what else is exciting, Luke? I don't know if we've talked about it on the show at all, but mm-hmm. you in your, you know, I, I don't want to say infinite wisdom because it's definitely not infinite, but somewhat wisdom. It's pretty close. Uh, decided to make a, a NFL eliminator league this uh, this season with, you know, yours truly and a few of your boys. And today, courtesy of the New York football Jets beating the Eagles, your boy is the eliminator champ. Damn. And immediately after that game, I hit everybody with the meme, tell me to bring me my money. That's exactly so, right. Uh, and yeah, I just wanted to shout that out real quick because, you know. Well, be and if you guys haven't done ball. it, you can speak to this, Jonathan, as the, as the, the reigning champ, but pretty fun. I, I think that a lot of people get knocked out really early. Um, I would know. I got knocked out in week one. Shout out Geno Smith and the Seahawks. I got way too cute. The, very, with it. the only person that got eliminated in week one. Yeah, there was 15 or 16 people in the league, and I was the only one that gets eliminated week one. The commish himself. It just, you know, bad things happen to good people. But yeah, if you guys don't know, by the way, just to not that really anybody cares, but if you're looking forward to, if you want to do it in the future, like next season or whatever, it is essentially every week you pick a team that you think is going to win that week. But the trick and the catch is once you pick that team to be your lock to win that week, their game, you can't use them again throughout the rest of the season. And I know a lot of people listening to this are probably like, we're only on whatever it is, week six or week seven. It's like, yeah, but also the stat is that at the end of last year, out of all the entries in ESPN, so hundred tens of thousands, hundred thousands, whatever it was, only five people were alive in the last week out of the whole ESPN app. So our league, basically the last person standing wins. So Jonathan now wins. Maybe you can keep making picks and, and ESPN will give you a million dollars. I have no idea what the price is actually on the app itself, but um, well, the thing about it is like, you can only pick each team once. 
Mm-hmm. So like once you've used the Chiefs, you can't use the Chiefs. Once you've used the right. Dolphins, you can't use the Dolphins. You got to so look that's ahead. What There's a little bit of look ahead. Difficult. Yeah, needed. For sure. And I was like getting to the end of like, oh, this team will definitely beat this team this week. I was getting to sort of the end of those. So I was like, man, if I if everybody makes it through this week, cause there was like three of us the last few weeks. And I was just thinking like, man, I don't know how much longer I can keep this going. Mm-hmm. And luckily, I, the Dolphins killed the Panthers today. And then the other two in our league took the Eagles over the Jets, which I came very close to doing, by the mm-hmm. way. And so, you don't get you know, to see anybody's picks. So, like, Jonathan couldn't have right. seen the other two people picked, you know, the Eagles and then been like, oh, I need to get different. He just, you know, did it because he's, he's built different, clearly. Yeah. You know, some people know ball and they profit <laughs> off of their friends. You know, Others so. pick the Seahawks in week one. Um, well, super you know, exciting. Week one through three is really a, a crapshoot, but that's neither here nor there. Yeah. Jonathan, it is now time to shout out our friends over at jam hot chicken proudly serving the city beautiful jam hot chickens bringing jams culture and hot chicken to the heart of winter park there if you guys don't know this is like if you've ever been to nashville gotten hot chicken you haven't heard us talk about it yet it's locally owned in winter park located at 400 west new england avenue and suite 13 in hannibal square right you can follow jam hot chicken on all social media my favorite part about jam hot chicken or their favorite like nugget if you will that we've that we've come to know about them is that jam hot chicken ranked number four on yelp's top florida restaurants of 2023 genuinely it blew me away when we were you know getting points together for jam hot and seeing what you know is notable all that kind of stuff this is the one thing i came across where i was like that's super impressive in all of Florida, I looked it up. Yelp actually, like they they did these reviews, and they had Jam Hot Chicken at the number four restaurant in all of Florida of 2023. So super impressive. Really excited to be partnered with Jam Hot Chicken. And Jonathan, we now have had a couple games under our belt, which means we can roll out the new segment. You can tell our listeners about our new segment. I think we've talked about it a little bit. Uh, but on each Monday episode this season, we're rolling out a new segment that we're calling the Jam Hot Chicken Jam of the Week, where we talk about the best magic dunk from the past week. Everybody knows where this is going. I think by like Wednesday of last week, even by Tuesday of last week, we were like, well, that's the Jam Hot Chicken Jam of the Week. We don't have to really debate. There's just not, not going to really be a way to top this. But there were some some honorable mentions. So we talk about uh, Paolo's second dunk, you know, on, on Jonas Valanciunas last Tuesday against the Pelicans. Talk about uh, Markel Fultz's dunk, you know, basically almost from the free throw line, like brought that thing all the way back, cocked back the tomahawk in the jam. And then this uh, last game on Thursday against the Cavs, late in the game, Anthony Black driving from the left wing, takes a couple of dribbles, gets into the lane, just elevates, again, cocks it all the way back, and throws down the jam. When that happened, I tweeted out that, hey, like this looks eerily similar to the Mario Hazonia dunk and his first summer league game. You remember that. Hazonia was like at the, the top of the key, like sort of towards like the left wing, and just like two, three dribbles into the lane, and, and same style of dunk. Mario Hazonia also had a game winner in that game, and we all thought that this was like the first coming of Luka Doncic, right? Like Luka Doncic is like what we maybe thought and hoped Mario Hazonia would become. He absolutely did not. Although Mario Hazonia, his team beat Luka Doncic's team this past week in NBA preseason. So maybe there is something there. But no, the Jam Hot Chicken Jam of the Week, the first ever Jam Hot Chicken Jam of the Week, by the way, is Paolo Bancaro's dunk against the New Orleans Pelicans from pa- this past Tuesday. Not only the the dunk and, and the and one over Jonas Valanciunas, it was the crossover on Zion Williamson. So Paolo B- Bancaro is bringing the ball up, hits the left to right between the legs dribble, and immediately goes into the right to left crossover, leaving Zion Williamson on Bourbon Street. He, he was nowhere to be found. He certainly wasn't in the Smoothie King Center at that point. And then Paolo takes another dribble, elevates chest to chest over uh, Jonas Valanciunas and finishes with the poster dunk. Come to think of it, I actually, I don't think that was an and one, but it, it should wasn't. have been an and one. 
yeah, but sure was not. absolutely ferocious. And yeah. then he did it again to him a little bit later. But that first one was incredible. And early candidate for dunk of the year, all things considered. Right. And it is going to have a little bit of an asterisk by it just because it's not going to be a regular season dunk. But it still was against starters and star players at that. Valanchunas, kind of a key part there for sure in, in New Orleans. And then he gets the cross on Zion. Zion reaches, Paolo teaches, takes it to the rack. And I just super impressive. Which part of that sequence, Jonathan, was more impressive? Or like, which one do you love more looking back at it? Do you love the fact that he crosses Zion? Or do you just love a good old-fashioned poster over a seven-footer? I'm going to have to go with the finish because without the finish, mm-hmm. the crossover is it's it's nice. Yeah, but it, it would just it would be like uh, Jameer Nelson, who whose ankles did he break so badly back in the day? Was it Paul Pierce where like Paul Pierce stumbles backwards and falls on his rear end? But then Jameer doesn't make the jumper. So it's like almost an insane highlight. You have to have the finish. Like if it's a crossover, if it's a step back, whatever it is. If that you don't finish the play, it doesn't really mean a ton. But it was amazing that it that he crossed up. Uh, I little I did, Zion, not little I Zion, did but Zion up, in the the process. I, I did pull up the uh, Jameer ankle breaker on Paul Pierce. Cracked that poor boy's yeah. ankles. That man just yep. just completely Couldn't finish the jumper. Melted and melt. Yeah, well, melted into the paint. Jameer hits him with the sidestep left to the left rises can't get it to go as you said but yeah yeah, that's a fun one to look back on but yeah so that is uh the first ever jam hot chicken jam of the week presented you by jam hot chicken our boys go check them out i keep saying boys there aren't just boys there go check out our friends at jam hot chicken i don't mean to keep doing that i really apologize for that luke uh we got another post game live after the magic victory over the Cleveland Cavaliers on Thursday. And again, producer Kevin brought the, brought the, I don't want, I don't want to say the heat because we hate the heat, but brought the magic. Kevin, there we go. Kevin brought the magic to the post game live show presented by Rockham. And we weren't really sure what to expect with these post game live shows. Like the first one was awesome. It was the first one that we did. We were giving away socks. So we're like, of course that great got like a great response and got like great viewership. You know, that, I think we had like 156 peak concurrent viewers on that first one. And we're like, oh, this is the second one is when it is going to die down. Not really. I'm pretty sure we had like over 140 peak concurrent viewers on that second one. Both of those have gotten like a thousand you know, views after the fact, after the, like yeah. since then. People really just love Magic Basketball, obviously, but they love producer Kevin. Kevin is like, look, I I was not meaning for this to go this well. And the only thing that really bothers me about this, Luke, is how long have we been begging Kevin to come on the podcast regularly to no avail, always denied it, didn't want to. And now he's over here just racking up views and downloads left and right with these post game live shows. Doesn't even mean to. The guy doesn't even mean to. Doing it by accident. And he's crushing it. I told Absolutely him this. crushing it. I told him this, and I think I shared this similar sentiment last, you know, our last episode. But I was like, Kevin, I, before we got on and started recording, I was like, Kevin, I, I'm irritated that the Magic don't play tomorrow, Monday, as you guys are listening to this. But I'm equally as irritated that I don't get to watch another post game live because it is so much fun. You and I are are so used to being behind the mic, and then if you and I ever listen back to our episodes, it's either to like listen to ourselves and like overanalyze or critique ourselves or whatever, or just can't bear to listen to our own voices. I have an issue doing that. But when it's, when it's, when it's post game live time, I'm on my couch. I prop up the recliner. I'm smiling, thinking about it. I just pop on the TV. Oh, there's Kevy. And then I just, I get to listen as a fan. A lot of fun, instant reactions. Kevin says things. I'm like, Oh, going to write that down for the show. Uh, make sure that I point that out as well and, and and shout out to his job that he's doing. It is it is very difficult to watch something and then go into it instant reaction and go and do it as well as, as Kevin is doing. Kevin also is producing the show too. So he's the graphics you see coming up, split screen, his face cam box at the bottom right of the screen with the stats. Like He's built it all out. He's doing it all himself. So 
setting the bar very high for me and yourself, Jonathan, down the road here. Hope you guys will continue to, to tune into those. A lot of fun. And we got another one coming this week on Tuesday as we rematch against the Pelicans. I've had a lot of fun like participating in the chat. I know a lot of other people have as well. But like Kevin threatened to ban me from my own <laughs> chat the other day, which I didn't really appreciate. Like, I'm just having a little bit of fun. You know what I mean? Like everybody else is having fun. I wanna I wanna get in on the fun in the in the chat. So if you guys, first of all, if you haven't caught one of those, make sure that you tune in. There's gonna be one after um, the game that's coming up on Tuesday versus the Pelicans, another one on Friday after the game versus Flamengo. And then we're going to be doing one after every regular season game. So if you haven't subscribed to us on YouTube, head over to YouTube. Just search the Six Man Show. You'll be able to find the channel there. When Kevin posts those, you can click the little notify me button so that you're notified as soon as he goes live after those games. Make sure you comment on those. Make sure you're if you're watching those, get those likes up. You know, when we've got 141 people watching and we've got like seven likes until we say, hey, get those likes up. Then everybody starts smashing that like <laughs> button, which is awesome. But make sure that you guys are are, are checking uh, that out. It's been a lot of fun and just can't wait to, to see how that continues to grow throughout the season here. Luke, let's talk about this game from Thursday. The Orlando Magic taking on the Cleveland Cavaliers with the 108 to 105 victory. I wasn't really sure you know, what to expect going into this game because we had the win on Tuesday over the Pelicans, the 122 to 105 win there. And we didn't really see the Magic starters play a ton in the second half of that game. But you would expect at some point throughout the preseason that the starters will, will start to play more and more and their minutes will resemble like their re- regular season minutes and the rotation will mirror the regular season rotation. In this game, we did get a bit more from the starters, you know, in that, that second half there. Uh, but for the most part, like the end of the third quarter and, and, you know, all of the fourth quarter was really like the second, third, you know, sort of fourth stringers. You have more guys on the roster right now than you will, you know, for the start of the regular season. You've got guys that are on Exhibit 10 contracts, you know, some guys that are going to be playing for the Osceola Magic. But this game, Luke, I, I just, I'm trying to not freak out. I'm trying not to get overly excited. I tweeted early Friday morning. I was at the gym and mind you, I did have two scoops of pre-workout ghost (laughs) energy like coursing through my veins. So I was already pumped. But as I was just thinking back and sort of like reliving the game from the the night before, I just started to get so fired up. Like I was about to lift the entire gym in there, right? Like I, I had a great bicep pump going and I'm just like, I, I know we're going to talk about this more in, in in detail, but the magic went not not just went toe to toe, like outplayed the Cleveland starters. Now there there were guys that were missing, right? Like no, uh, what's that big tall fella? Jared Allen. No Jared Allen in that game. I think there was somebody else that they were missing as well. Magic, you know, mostly healthy. No Gary Harris in this one. Joe Ingles rested in the first preseason game. They gave Gary Harris the night off in the second preseason game. So again, we saw Anthony Black in that second unit, but Cleveland wanted this game, maybe not the entire game, but they played their starters for about eight or nine minutes in the third quarter because they were trying to get that game back from the Magic. This game was tied after one, 31 all. Magic led, I believe, by 12 at halftime. And Cleveland could have said, like the Pelicans did, we're just not going to play our starters in the second half. Magic starters played in the second half. Cleveland starters played in the second half. And basically when it became apparent that Cleveland was not going to get this game close, JB Bickerstaff pulled their starters. I think the Magic lead was like 12 or or 13 at that point. The lead got up to 16 at one point. Then sure, with the third stringers in and some of the Exhibit 10 guys, I think Cleveland went on like a 13 and nothing run over the course of the last couple of minutes. Hit a three, I think, with like 40 seconds left. To bring the game within three, Magic couldn't score. Cleveland's got one last possession, and they don't even get a three-point attempt off. Mm-mm. Like I, I forget who the guy was for Cleveland, but he had a, a decent look with a few seconds left there. Let's see. It was um, oh, Porter. Maybe it was Porter for Cleveland. 
But he had a good look at a three, decided not to take it, and like drove into the lane. I'm like, what are you doing? There's like no time left on the clock, and you all need a three. And essentially threw the game away, Luke. Yeah. But he- what was so exciting was the way that the Magic starters played against the Cleveland Cavalier starters. And I don't want to say it wasn't domination, but it was more than just like going toe to toe with those guys. Like they outperformed them significantly. Amani Bates should have been furious that last Correct. possession. Amani Bates it starts to kind of light the magic up and the exhibit 10 guys on the magic near the end of this game finishes with three of six from three. Amani Bates without question should have been the guy in the final seconds of that game. So I'm sure that he was irritated about that. Hit the three the, like 30 seconds before to make yeah. it a three point game. And I mean, and this is a guy that's got a huge chip on his shoulder. He, <laughs> You were looking at him a couple years ago like, oh, this guy's going to go be like the number one pick in the draft or a top five or top 10 pick. And then he goes round two, pick 49. Shout out to the guy on Twitter, by the way. This is just a side note. I just thought of you. This guy on Twitter, not too long, or like during the draft process or like a little bit, like a couple months prior, talking about how Monty Bates was going to go top 10 or something like that still. And I was like, dude, he's not top. He's not top 10. He used to be. He's not. And he ends up getting picked. 49th in the draft so shout out to that guy on twitter anyway Amani bates uh <laughs> and it was like it that. wasn't the last couple of years it it was like since he was like a seventh grader yeah so like the last six around. seven years something like that well n- maybe not but like a good chunk of the last right. six seven years like the last couple of years he's fallen off a little bit but mm-hmm. there was like a four-year stretch there where Amani bates was like the projected number one overall pick for the 2023 NBA draft class. And also what I will add as well to this game, Jonathan, in terms of my takeaways, the Magic starters didn't play more minutes than any of Mobley, uh, Donovan Mitchell, and Struess. They didn't. They played the same amount of minutes as Dean Wade. 20 minutes for everybody aside from Franz, who plays 19. Clearly, the goal going into this was that the starters were probably going to play 20 minutes or so, right? Then, you look at crossover of the Cavs. Mobley plays 22. Garland plays 17. Donovan Mitchell, 29. Struess, 24. Um, and then, like, Niang and Okaro, they play, like, 18 minutes, 23 minutes, respectively, off the bench. And then, also, for who they were missing, Jonathan, yeah, that tall fellow, uh, Jarrett Allen, as you described him, and uh, Ricky Rubio and Karis LeVert. Those, those Karis guys were LeVert, that was out. the other guy. Ricky, Ru- Ricky Rubio, you know, still rehabbing the, yeah. uh, the knee, I think. And right. uh, taking time off. You know, he didn't play for Spain in the, uh, mm-hmm. in the what's, what was that tournament that we spent two months covering? The FIBA World Cup. <laughs> Good grief. My brain is completely <laughs> shot right now. But yeah, they didn't have some guys. We didn't have Gary Harris, like, I'm not giving anybody any, nobody's getting any empathy over here. The last couple of years, what we've been dealing with, like, no, Donovan Mitchell got clamped by Jalen Suggs in this game. We obviously, Franz Wagner was, FIBA Franz was absolutely fantastic. Mo Wagner was, was doing his thing. Cole Anthony was doing his thing. Like, Markel was doing his thing. A lot of guys doing a lot of things in this game. We'll talk more specifically about the box score in a in a second here but listen i'm going to i'm going to read some stats here and like i i said in that tweet the morning after this game i know it's preseason let's throw all rational out of the window all right if you don't want to hear homerism you don't want to hear unnecessary hype you don't want to hear overreactions you might want to fast forward a couple of minutes here but if you're one of those sickos like me and you just every little morsel of hype that you can muster, that you can hold inside of your body before you just burst. All right. Yeah, I said that. I, I got a couple this. of things that I want you to know. All right. I'm right now on NBA.com and I'm on the team's advanced stance, advanced stats panel. Let me let me let me learn you something real quick. Offensive rating right now. Magic are 15th in the NBA. So, you know, just middle of the road, right? They're, they're right there. Defensive rating, Magic are ninth in the league right now. Overall net rating, the Magic are fifth in the league in preseason. 
assist percentage, basically total percentage of, of baskets that the Magic are assisting on right now, seventh in the league, assist to turnover ratio, second in the league, turnover percentage, so amount of possessions that end in a turnover right now. Magic are second in the league. Middle of the pack, offensive rating. Okay, we can deal with that. Ninth defensive rating. One of the best assist percentages in the league, one of the best assist to turnover percentages in the league, and one of the best turnover percentages in the league. Magic are scoring, they're defending, they're taking care of the basketball. Like three major tenets of what this team wanted to achieve this year. It's only two preseason games, I understand that. But the reason that I'm letting myself get irrationally excited about this, and probably my hopes up a little bit too high, Something just looks and feels different. This does not look and feel even like the team that went 29 and and 28, you know, over the last 57 games last year. This doesn't feel like that team. This feels like a different team. This feels and looks like a better team. And the defense isn't even where it should be yet. If I have any concern, it's that like the defense just hasn't looked incredible yet. Guys have shown flashes, and most for the most part, we've been solid. But two preseason games in, and like I'm about to act up, and I know I shouldn't be. And we could be looking back on this a few months from now and be like, wow, remember how silly it was when we were talking about two preseason games? But I don't know about you, Luke, and I don't know about you listeners and viewers. Just something feels different. There, so I, I've got a little fun trivia for you. It's nothing crazy, but I got some trivia for you for the preseason or for going back to last season with Palo Bancaro. Okay. But in this game, Jonathan, all starters once again, because same case in that Pelicans game, double digit plus or minus they're in the positive, all of them, right? Your bench. There's a lot of weird, wacky rotations happening. Once you get past the starters that I don't really fault them too much. But you know, you got guys like DJ Wilson who played all of six minutes, but he managed to get a minus be a minus eleven. Who has right? been waived. Yes. That is a bit of magic news right there. DJ Wilson waived. Now, when I'm talking about this, Paolo Bancaro finishes his game, Jonathan, only six shots. Not exactly where you want him to be when it comes to shot volume at all. Two of six from the field, six points. Okay. We can talk about the other stuff in a minute because he did do a lot of other things well in this game. He doesn't need to only be scoring. I love that he's able to do things like get assists and and whatever, right? Playmake and, and kind of realize a different role for himself and his capabilities. Jonathan, going back to last year, Paolo Bancaro, if you had to guess, maybe you know, but if you had to guess, how many games last year did Paolo Bancaro score under 10 points? In the preseason? In the regular season. Oh, the regular season. If you had to guess. Ooh, you're putting me on the spot. Less I than would 10 say, points. It's not a ton at all. Yeah, but. I would say five. Okay, you're close. Four, okay? Oof, I knew it was In four. those four games, do you know what the Magic's record was? I'm going to guess four and no because you're asking for a reason. No, 0-4. Oh Magic okay. did not Dang it. win a game when Palo Bancaro scores under 10 points. I am asking for a reason. The reason is, in this game where the Magic starters give the Cavs all they can handle, he scores six points. But guess what else he does? He is able to uh, pass the ball effectively. He has six assists in this game. Last year, in the games where he scored less than 10, he had three assists, three assists, three assists, five assists. You lose all of those games. Paolo Bancaro score has six assists in this game, two steals, four rebounds, a plus 14, and the plus or minus. The Magic win this game. They win this game more decidedly, in my opinion, You know, if we're not playing Exhibit 10 guys near the end. Granted, Cavaliers are as well, right? But all that to say, if Paolo can get involved in different ways and facilitate the ball, do the right thing, make the right reads. Guys like Franz can step up. Markel Fultz can step up. Um, Mo Wagner steps up in this one points-wise with 14, right? You are going to have to 
challenge these other guys to just step up when Paolo Bancaro just doesn't have it. And it's not that he was, you know, shy or like it was that he was basically he just didn't get enough shots in this game. Only six shots. But it doesn't matter when you got guys like Franz putting on the clink that he did. Markel Fultz, what, he had 10 points in the first quarter. I would have liked to personally see him be more assertive offensively throughout the rest of his minutes. But he has 10 points in that first quarter. You think maybe Paolo, you know, Paolo, you think Markel might score 15 to 20 in this game. He ends up with 13. All that to say, once again, this team wins the basketball game. Coming into this season, who are, can your team step up when one of your guys is down, your star player is down in terms of being able to shoot the ball, score the basketball? Are you going to be able to win those games? I was super impressed by these guys in this game to still win despite that first That second quarter, this is like the second game in a row where you've had an impressive scoring output, right? In terms of also defensively, like comparatively, second quarter, you outscore them 32 to 20. And when that Pelicans game, you had a 41 point quarter in the first half. It's not like we're talking about, you know, when guys weren't playing full strength, essentially. You're able to go on toe to toe and giving them all they could ask for. I I was just very impressed with that aspect, even with Palo Bancaro scoring just six. And only 14 turnovers for the Magic. And three of those coming from uh, Goga Batadze, Trevlin Queen, and DJ Wilson. Who, uh, again, we mentioned a moment ago, DJ Wilson was waived. Uh, that was so that the Magic could sign Mie Oni, who I, I believe played for the Magic this year in in, uh, in uh, Summer League. But taking care of the basketball in another one of these games, if you take away those three turnovers, just, uh, what is that, 11 for the Magic, which is super impressive. And you compare that to Cleveland's 20. Um, one thing the Magic could do a better job of is, is rebounding, out-rebounded 45 to 39 in this game. And that's something that we said all of last season going up and down here. So you've got Wendell with six rebounds. He led the team. Got Paolo with four, Franz with three. I'm not going to overreact to those guys, but it still feels like those guys could be rebounding better. Like Franz should be around five or six rebounds a game. Paolo should be around, you know, seven, eight rebounds a game. We know Wendell is going to be around 10, but we're going to need our wings to just rebound the basketball better. That was something that the Magic struggled with all last year was rebounding. Paolo's talked about that. Franz has talked about that being an emphasis. I want to, I want to see that a bit more here, you know, because that's something that really could end up hurting the Magic in the long run. But we've got, Great rebounding guards, thankfully. I mean, Cole Anthony, Anthony Black both added four apiece. Markel with four, Jalen with three. So it's great that we have guards that can sort of help supplement. Uh, but we just we're going to need more out of the wings for sure. Um, Magic shot twelve of thirty five from behind the arc in this one. Good for thirty four percent. Going to need to shoot the ball a little bit better, like thirty four percent as we start to get into the regular season really isn't going to get it done for the Magic. Let's see where they're shooting right now throughout the preseason so far. We just sort by three-point percentage. Magic are 17th right now, and they are shooting 33.8% uh, through the preseason so far, which isn't going to be good enough. But I don't know what it is, man. Just the, the team, like the the flow of the offense seems better. Like guys are in the right roles. They know what they're doing. Paolo with six assists, like he had some passes in this one, like the left hand across the court uh, to Franz in the corner for the three was awesome. He had another one where he was cutting the rim and Franz, of course, just cut at the perfect time. He found Franz for the dunk. He had two or three assists in this game to to Franz. Found another one, uh, Jalen Suggs in the corner for a three. We've all, in the, in the magic circle, people have known the playmaking potential that Paolo has and some of the passes that he's able to make. And like our boy, Kenny, Kenny Beecham, I was watching his stream on Friday and he went through and he was just watching uh, the highlights from the Magic and Cavs game. And he was like, man, if he, he saw like the first or second assist that Paolo made, he's like, man, if and he found Franz on another cut, Franz like cut from like the left, uh, like sideline uh, back door and Paolo just found him on the cut for the layup. He's like, oh man, if Paolo's going to be playmaking like this, like this is going to be crazy. And in my mind, I was like, well, you just wait because he's got a couple passes in this game that are even sicker than that. 
people are going to start to realize that. And that is really what is going to unlock this team and going to unlock Paolo Bancaro in, in general. Yeah. The other thing too, as well, is when you're talking about the three pointers, yes, the percentage is not necessarily where you want it, but the volume is absolutely there. Now, in the Pelicans game, you could say that they settled a little bit too much for threes, but you end up getting the win in that game. They still looked good. The offense looks ahead of the defense, which is crazy to me, but they do. And in that Pelicans game, Jonathan, they shoot 45 three pointers. To me, in that's game, too many. Yeah. And then the game, but in the game against Cleveland, they shoot 35, which is more where I would like them to be. Yeah. Because last year, 31 three pointers attempted per game last year that was bottom of the league ranked you like 26th or 27th in the league in three-point attempts but it's because you couldn't shoot them and that's what we talked about all the time last year was like yeah of course you're not shooting that many because you don't trust that these this team can shoot but i think now these guys have taken you know got another year under their belt you've brought in a guy like joe ingles gary harris has obviously returned Wendell Carter looks improved from the three-point line, especially that corner three that we saw. There's no reason that this team can't be middle of the pack when it comes to three-point attempts per game. I think that's where they're going to have to be to see more success this year. And if you're looking at middle of the pack, you're looking at about 30, a little over like 32 and a half, 33 threes a game. Being that you're at 40 right now. Right, which... They're fifteenth in the league. I, 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 if they're like you know eighteen, nineteen, twentieth in the league in attempts, that's fine. But the three point percentage, you know, you want that to be a little bit. You know, it's not going to be close to forty. But if we can be you know thirty four, thirty five percent from three, increase the attempts a little bit from last year. You know, decrease from where they currently are. You know, through two games in the preseason, I think we're going to be okay. But you want to see guys take like incremental, like we want Paolo, you know, to to be in the you know the 30s this year. We want Jalen Suggs to be in the mid 30s this year. Franz, you know, you want him to be you know 36, 37 percent. If Wendell can be 36, 37 percent, Cole Anthony can be around there as well. Like we'll we'll be doing okay. Those are the guys that are going to take the you know bulk of the threes, the most volume. Gary Harris, Joe Ingles, those guys will be close to 40%. But we just need everybody to, to take a baby step forward this year. It doesn't have to be anything crazy, but you just can't be as bad shooting from distance as you were last year. No, you, you need to be, like I said, shooting where I, where I just said as far as three-point attempts per game. But you also need to be trying to shoot like 35% from three instead of last year you were or like 36 or 37% especially with higher volume last year. Like I said, one of the lower in attempts, but also one of the lower in percentage. So you need to be shooting like 35, 36, 37% from three this year on a few more threes a game. Yeah, last year, 34.6% from behind the arc. So if we get to 35, 36%, you know, a few more attempts per game, um, that's just going to get you a few more points in each game. And the Magic, who um, you know were one, you know, definitely top ten in clutch games last year, lost you know more than their fair share of those games that were within five points and five or a few minutes to go. A couple more threes, you know, a game will will definitely help uh, in that regard. And then the Magic just have to be better. But you know, early signs, pretty encouraging. You know, talked about them being top ten defensively. And it doesn't feel like they are anywhere near their ceiling in that regard. That'll be something that I, you know, I want to see them improve because uh, we've got two preseason games left. Really one got this last one coming up on Tuesday at home against the Pelicans. And then you're at home on Friday versus Flamengo. But we really shouldn't see much of the starters, I would assume, on Friday uh, against Flamengo. All right, we want to give a quick shout out to our wonderful patrons, the folks that help make each and every one of our episodes possible. Uh, if you haven't heard before, uh, Patreon uh, is a platform where you can help financially support your favorite creators, 
help them create the content that you love. And if you want to hear more about our Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash the six man show, where for as little as $2 a month, uh, you can help financially support our show. Plus we have some additional benefits like access to our discord channel and uh, discounts off of regular season Orlando magic home games. Uh, and every single episode that we have brand new patrons, well, we give them a very special shout out. And this week uh, we have Kane Eckler who joined our elite tier uh, at the annual level, just went and paid for the whole year. You do get a pretty significant discount uh, for just paying for the entire year in advance. So a big shout out to Kane Eckler. Really, really appreciate you joining the the family here and joining the community. And then as always, we shout out all of our, all of our hall of fame and elite tier patrons on each episode. So I'll go ahead and start with the court cousins, Drew Gooden, Armin, Carson, Tulo, Jonathan Borges, normal magic player history, Gabe Gaines, Wiffle, Michael Martin, Jamel Miller, Michael Salapong, Donkey Punch, Dave, Paolo and Francis, Warren, Pierre A, Dylan Holden, Mr. Mikey, Eduardo Sanchez, Drum, Drum, Drummy, Drum, Drum, Daniel, Dodo 15, Bobby Skinner, PB in the mix, Goaty 93, Teddy Sylvia, Eric Lopez, Fuchsia, Juan Geraldo, Bill Fulton, Edmund Lagone, Jose Esquilin, Destined for Greatness, Caleb Pete, Cannibalism, Ty, Mr. TV, ESPN Really Sucks, Gear 95, Shred, Junior Bruce, Half Reek, and Shahin 177, Obi the Don, Himlo, Ben Himro, Arm Prop 221, Ray Pastrana, Magic Kid 714, Spanking Season Soft Taco, Fuego Nando, Victor Cologne, Irish Magic Mike, Austin Lampy, Random Hustle, Only Franz, Maria, Keith Wallace, Fritz, Currency Kev, Bruv Sal, Case and Green, Santi Leon, and Kane Eckler. A big thank you to all of our patrons. Once again, you can find us at patreon.com slash the six man show. Luke, last thing that we'll uh, you know discuss here before we start to wrap up this episode. Just we're not able to put a stamp on a lot of the questions that we had going into preseason just yet, but a couple of things I'm starting to feel a lot more comfortable. This was the second game in a row that Jalen Suggs was the starting shooting guard. No Gary Harris in this one. I feel like we're at the point where we can say Jalen Suggs like definitively is the starting shooting guard going into the season. If for no other reason than just like why would we waste two of our three legitimate preseason games starting Jalen Suggs at shooting guard and Russ and Gary Harris, by the way, in the entirety of one of these games, if Jalen was not going to be starting opening night for the Magic? It's interesting because I I was thinking about this as well, obviously, as every Magic fan has. But first preseason game of the year, Jalen gets thrown out there at starting shooting guard. Second game, and, and prior to that, Jamal Mosley talks about, I'm going to be giving some of the older guys some rest throughout the preseason. So tonight, Joe Ingles won't be playing, right? Second game rolls around, Jalen Suggs is starting. But Gary Harris is getting the rest that night. I I don't know if if if, if Gary, let's say he had started game one and it looked like he was going to be the start of the, start of the season, would he have gotten rest in game two? That I don't know. But I, I, that's why I need Tuesday's game to say that Jalen Suggs is starting, Gary Harris is playing, so that we have yet another you know, plot point that Jalen Suggs is starting over Gary Harris. That is when I'll be able to say, undoubtedly, Jalen Suggs will be the starting you know, two guard coming into opening night. But until then, I don't know. I'm cautiously optimistic that's going to be the case. But again, we've just seen Jamal make changes before i am a little hesitant but again cautiously optimistic jalen will be the starting shooting guard this year i just need to see it on tuesday if that wasn't the case already i feel like his performances and the way that that lineup has been performing together so far might have been a mistake if, if jamal mosey wasn't going to start jalen suggs to start the regular season Starting him in preseason might have been a mistake because now like he's given you a lot to think about. And if I'm Gary Harris and I was like under the impression that I was starting, I'd be like, maybe, maybe I'm not going to be starting because this that starting unit has been playing so well together. Um, in large part to the to the defense of Jalen Suggs. Like he's just genuinely been out there, like causing havoc, you know, deflections, poking the ball loose, poking it to his teammates, and they're like getting out on the break and everything like that. Obviously, he had the the one for five uh, shooting performance from deep in the first game, and this one was two of three. So that's what three of eight now, which is pretty close to to forty percent. Maybe my math isn't mathing there. Uh, again, super small 
sample size, like two games. I'm not ready to say like, oh, Jalen's going to be a 40% three point shooter. But if we look at like the stretch that he ended the year on last year and all the work that he was able to put in this off season, if Jalen Suggs is you know 35 or like if he gets a 36%, that's really going to do wonders like for this offense and, and for spacing, like just the perception of, of Jalen Suggs, you know, if teams start to perceive him as a shooter, and even a little bit of gravity in his direction is going to open things up for Franz, for Paolo, for Markel. So that's just going to be awesome. The The next thing, Luke, Jonathan Isaac, just nine minutes in this game. Don't think he played in the second half at all in this one, if I'm not mistaken. I'm looking, and I am correct, did not play a single second in the second half. It's starting to sort of feel like he's on a minutes restriction. Didn't play in the second half in either of these games. Eight minutes the first game, nine minutes the second game. I'm glad that he's playing in each of these games. Like we haven't seen him rested. That would be the one thing that I'll keep my eye on going into this third game. Like we've seen Joe Ingles rested. We've seen Gary Harris rested. Is somebody else going to be rested on on Tuesday? And if it is, is it Jonathan Isaac? Like he would be one of the older guys on the roster at this point. And if they're looking to sort of mitigate his workload and still sort of ramp him up, I don't know. It it sort of feels like J.I. is on a minutes restriction. I think so. I think he is. I would be irritated if he doesn't play on Tuesday for the yeah. sole fact that he played 11 games last year in the last three years. He needs as much run as, as he can. And it's almost it's- four years now. Yeah. Like January 1st of 2024 will be four years to the day from the first injury. First injury on New Year's. Yeah. He's, he has, like, I really hope that he plays on Tuesday. He's not already not playing 10 plus minutes in preseason. Roll him out there for the same eight or nine if that's what you're going to do, but don't make him sit. Continue to let him play, finish out the preseason. And then if you're going to, if you have him on a 15 minute restriction to start the season, then so be it. But at least right now, let him get some burn. I, I would be, I don't know, man. I would be surprised at this point because that's what I obviously have been paying attention to as well is looking at it like he's not eclipsed 10 minutes yet. He's not playing the same as like other guys in the bench unit. It's not like the starters are playing drastically different minutes than the, than the bench guys and the bench guys aren't playing very much because there's so many of them. The key bench guys are getting run. They're still able to hit like what? Like they're 15, 16, 17 minutes a game in preseason. No reason Jonathan Isaac shouldn't be able to unless he's going to be on a minutes restriction. And that I think he will be. So we'll see. Next thing, it seems like Mo Wagner is the backup five. Like through the first couple of preseason games, he's played the majority of the minutes there. Uh, this last one on Tuesday against the Cavs, uh, Mo Wagner played 15 minutes, 36 seconds. Uh, Gogo Batadze played 11 minutes, 21 seconds. Uh, pretty much all of that was with like the third stringer slash like Exhibit 10 and G League guys. I'm pretty confident that that Mo is going to be the the starter or the the backup center I should say to to start the season and he played well in this game uh in 15 minutes 14 points 4 of 5 from the floor 6 of 6 from the free throw line like Mo Wagner just continues to get to the free throw line and defensively you know it's sort of hit or miss what he's going to bring you on any given night sort of the same offensively like some nights you're going to get 14 points out of Mo Wagner. Some nights you're going to get five points out of Mo Wagner. But it seems like right now, like he is there. I mean, we could, whatever our our answers were to those last couple of questions, it's like, okay, well, we still want to see it on Tuesday, see what it looks like. But that seems to be the direction that, you know, these things are trending. Agreed. Yeah. Don't have much else to honestly add to it. I, yeah, I think that Goga, I liked him in preseason game one. I, I didn't so much enjoy it in preseason game two against Cleveland. Didn't bring you anything offensively really in his 11 minutes. And also, you know, aside from his one block, didn't really show me much defensively there to for me to be able to say that his defensive edge or rim protection is greater than the offensive value that Mo Wagner is able to bring this team on a given night. He is streaky. 
when a term come it but it really is i think it's just by like what the team needs basis and i think mo wagner has a good feel for and he has that level headedness to know you know okay i'm needed in this way or that way whatever it might be i just think he has a better feel for the game and he brings an energy and an edge that yeah like goga just doesn't bring right and you know i've been on record a few times th- saying like in terms of like the basketball player i think there are arguments to who is who is better like each of these guys brings you different things right but like the edge that mo wagner like the swagger that mo brings the intangibles like the intangibles is something that I think this team really values and, and I value quite frankly. Right. So I, I think Mo Wagner is going to be the, the uh, backup center to start the year. And then going back to the rookies, I'm super confident that neither Anthony black or jet Howard is going to be in the rotation opening night. Once we're not resting guys, like if we had Gary Harris in this game, Anthony black doesn't see the floor with the regular, you know, rotation. Same thing. The first game, no Joe Ingles, so he was sort of slotted in there. If everybody's healthy on Tuesday, I would really expect to only see Anthony Black and Jet Howard sort of at the end of the the game where Jamal Mosley is decided, like, okay, that's enough out of the regular rotation, guys, and then it brings in the mm-hmm. end of the bench. If if y'all remember, I believe it was last episode, or maybe it was the episode prior. I think it was the episode prior, where I talked about minute distribution last preseason. The third game was the game where Jamal Mosley played, like Palo played like 31 minutes in his third preseason game last year. I don't know if it'll be different because he's not a rookie anymore. We know what he brings to the table. He's feel It feels like he's in a groove to an extent, right? He doesn't shoot as much as you would hope for last time, but it feels like he knows his role, right? We, we know that. He's had a year to get to know his role in a whole offseason. So I wouldn't be shocked if the, if it... It, that isn't the same as a third preseason game of last year, but or the game before. I think last year, what well, I think we played five games actually, or something like that. Or we, I think we were like four and one. But regardless, I think it was actually the next to last preseason game last year that this happened. Guys playing like 28, 29, 30 minutes. This could happen on Tuesday night. I don't know. To your point, Jonathan, you as are far correct. As like, I'm, I'm looking at it right now. We went four and one last season in yeah, the preseason. I think it was that- and the, in game. the fourth game, uh, Paolo played 27, Franz 30, That's Wendell right. and Cole 31, Terrence Ross yeah. 28. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that, so we'll that see sounds if that trend, about right. If that trend continues, if that if that logic checks out, and if it does, Tuesday could be a... I think I hope that if there's a game that you're going to do that, I hope it's this one because like again, the Flamengo game on Friday, I don't really care about that. Aside from it just being a big hurrah to leading into the regular season, being at home and all that, closing out the preseason, closing out the preseason, spoiler alert for this week, closing out the preseason 4-0, that's going to happen on Friday. This team is just too deep, too hungry, and too fun and too young to not win every preseason game when it comes to playing against these older teams. And I guess I'll leave us with this. If I'm not mistaken... We're going to be doing a, a six fan show on Tuesday. That game against uh, against the New Orleans Pelicans here. I'm going through our old uh, text mails here to make sure that that is the case. But I'm almost positive that we've talked about. Yeah, we're doing a, a six fan show uh, coming up this Tuesday outside Amway after the game. Our boy Ben will be there. He'll be set up with the camera, the lights, the mic. So if you're going to that game, when you're coming out of Amway, be on the lookout for Ben. He'll, he'll be there uh, filming. Uh, we're just trying to you know get some reps in before the regular season starts. Everybody get a little practice in, in some of their, their new ro- roles before everything gets going here. But Luke, apart from like the, you know, the minutes and in, in the rotation, is there anything that you're looking for in this final preseason game? Like for me, I want to see like, mid-season Paolo Bancaro, you know, form. Like he's played well these first couple of games, like hasn't really done anything like too crazy statistic-wise. Obviously, he had the the big dunk. Um, but you know, 6 points in the the game Tuesday against the Pelicans and then uh then what was it here? Where's the stupid points? And then it was 12 points uh versus the Pelicans. So 
hasn't gone crazy yet. Like I want to see, give me a 20 point game before preseason's over Paolo. Because the reason that I say that, because like this offense is going to go as Paolo Bancaro does in the regular season. And that's going to look like Paolo Bancaro scoring between like 22 and 25 points a night. So like we haven't forgotten, but like, just, just show us it before we get into the regular season. I want, I want to see that. Yeah. I, I am looking. I want to see Mark Fault stroke that thing, Kazo. From the corner, from the corner, that three looked good. The one we've gotten to see from Mark against the Cavs, he goes one of two from beyond the arc. I want to. I want to see another Mark three go down on Tuesday. I just, that three was as good of a three as we've seen him take since like summer league is rookie year. Yeah. Like it seemed like by the time he got to the regular season with Philadelphia, if I'm not mistaken, his rookie year, like the shoulder was already messed up from the thoracic outlet syndrome. And then Mm -hmm. we saw like multiple iterations of his jump shot as like it continually like deteriorated over the course of, you know, a few months there. And then he, you know, he missed a, a chunk of time and then was like in and out of the lineup that was like as good as we've seen like since he started to have issues. And I keep saying like there there's going to be a point where like is he ever going to get back to that Washington stroke? I have real doubts like I think it's valid to have doubts about that, but I also keep thinking like at some point it, it's going to stop getting better. And like over the course of the last couple of years it's been slow, but like every off season he comes back and it looks a little bit better. And then it looks a little bit better. I don't, I'm not going to sit here and be like, Oh, two years from now, Markel is going to be shooting like 37% or 38% from three, which would like change the dynamic of this team. And I hate to say it like this, but he's right now it's looking like he's going to be a free agent this off season. That could change the dynamic of whatever team he is on. I hope it's here but there's like a non-zero chance that it's not. And I'm just like, man, if Markel can shoot 34% from three this year on low volume and the jump shot looking good, that would that would get me excited about his future even a bit, a bit more than I already am. Another thing to note, Jonathan, the Pelicans are own three in the preseason. Mm, they have lost every game this is going to be their final game of the preseason until they open october 25th against the memphis grizzlies so i think you're going to get a, a real dress rehearsal and maybe more reason for the magic to play like a dress rehearsal game because it's going to be the pelicans last game of the preseason they're trying to find their groove their guys their key guys haven't played a lot of minutes together in terms of health, right? You you look at, you know, really like Zion, Brandon Ingram, and then you look at even Valanchunas. Those guys haven't gotten a whole lot of run together. They're still trying to figure it out. They have a new offense that they're running, essentially, with Herb Jones playing a little bit of point guard, Zion playing, Zion playing the five. They've got a lot of stuff to figure out, and I think they're going to use this game as a full dress rehearsal I think we see these guys play 25 to 30 minutes for the Pelicans. I'm hoping we see the same with the Magic, like I had alluded to, and how Mosley handled the, the, you know, the next to last game last year in preseason. Again, I think this more so mirrors a regular season game in terms of like the mm-hmm. rotation and minutes. So like, like the game against Flamengo, you know, guys like Anthony Black and Jed Howard and you know newly signed Mie Oni and and maybe even Caleb Houston if he's healthy enough to play on Friday you know, after missing the, the first few games with, I think it's some ankle stuff that he's got going on. Those guys are going to get their shine on Friday. Tuesday needs to be like, this is our, our regular season dress rehearsal. And I want us to win that game. Like the magic played pretty well against the, the Pelican starters uh, last week. And, you know, bad first quarter played better in the second quarter then when like the Magic sort of took the lead in that game, that's when we pulled our starters. Pelican starters didn't play in the second half. So I want to see us sort of more so mirror the game on Thursday versus Cleveland, mm-hmm. where we start off well, we really start to 
put it on them. Put it know, on them. Put it on them. Mm-hmm. And then c- just keep putting it on them. And just, just win the whole game. Put it on just play. Just put, them, put it on them. You know? Just that's all we want, dude. Put it on them. Put it on them. That's what I want to see. So. All right. I think it's going to do it for this one, Luke. What do you say? All right. Let's get out of here. All right. Let's get out of here. For, don't forget. Check out those post-game live shows. And hey, if you're going to the game on Tuesday, be on the lookout for Ben outside of Amway with the the lights, the camera, the microphone, the action, the action. all of it. Mm. The action. Put it on him. Just all right. Put it on him. That's gonna don't put it on Ben. Whatever you do, don't put it on <laughs> Ben. We will we will call the cops if you put it on Ben. All right. That's gonna do it for this one. Thanks so much uh, for Luke Sylvia. This has been Jonathan Osborne. You all have been listening to The Six Man Show, and we will catch you guys next time. See ya. Thanks for listening to The Sixth Man Show. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes and Spotify to get new episodes downloaded directly to your phone. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to give us a five-star rating and a review. It helps out the show a lot. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Sixth Man Show. We'll catch you guys next time. Go Magic!